This is the podcast of the Nova Center on Business, Human Rights and the Environment. Welcome. Hello everyone, my name is Anna Duarte and I am a master's student in law and management at Nova School of Law and a research assistant at Nova Center on Business, Human Rights and the Environment. Today I have the pleasure to be with Alice and Laura and we are going to explore a little bit the topics of our podcast on business, human rights and the environment and explain to you some concepts that are very important in this matter. First, I want to thank Laura for accepting our invitation, and I want to ask my two colleagues to introduce themselves. Thank you. So first, I can start. Uh, my name is Alice. I have a bachelor in law, and I am currently uh, studying at Nova School of Law. I'm also a research assistant, you said. I am taking a master in international and European law. I am interested in the area of business, human rights and the environment because I find two things very interesting in the subject. First, the power that individuals have through their actions to change people's lives and have an impact on the environment. And second, how connected the entire world in easy to these two areas, human rights and the environment, which doesn't happen with the, all the areas of law. Laura? <laughs> Hello, everyone, and thank you, Anna, and for the invitation to participate in this first episode of the podcast. Uh, my name is Laura Inu Alvarez, and I have recently joined a Nova School of Law here in Lisbon as a postdoctoral researcher and lecturer in international law. And my main research interests are international human rights law and international humanitarian law. And I've been looking at the question of uh, non-state actors and their regulation and the international law and human rights law in particular. And traditionally, human rights law was understood to be binding only on states. And however, the globalization and other related processes have changed this state-centric view on the human rights and now we can discuss and reflect about uh, the possible duties of different parties involved including corporations and here in Lisbon I will develop a project about uh, non-judicial remedies for business related human rights abuses with the uh, purpose of finding ways to improve the effectiveness of these mechanisms. Thank you Laura. So I think it's really important to start with some basic concepts. And I think that human rights, it's a pretty good one to start with. So human rights are rights inherent to all human beings, regardless of race, sex, nationality, ethnicity, language, religion, or any other status. They are rights that we have simply because we exist as human beings. So they are the basic rights and freedoms that belong to every person in the world from birth until death. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1948 was the first legal document to set out the fundamental human rights to be universally protected. As the UN Guiding Principles Reporting Framework explains, the actions of business enterprises can affect people's enjoyment of their human rights either positively or negatively. So companies affect the human rights of their employees and contract workers, their customers, workers in their supply chains, communities around their operations, and even end users of their products and services. To give a little example, when we see companies exposing their workers and communities around their operations to toxic chemicals or even putting them in life-threatening safety risks, we have a company acting against human rights and in this case against the right to life of these people. As for the environment, in 2015, the fossil fuel industry and its products accounted for 91% of global industrial greenhouse emissions, 
and 70% of all human-made emissions. In addition to this fact, we know that companies play an important role in the disforestation of certain regions, in the contamination and pollution of certain places, and even in putting animal species at risk. All the impacts on the environment have an impact on human rights, especially in people in poverty, because they are more exposed to bad health conditions, hunger, and other problems. As an example of how business, human rights, and the environment can be in one case, I wanted to talk to you about the Shell case in Nigeria. So, in this case, four Nigerian farmers and fishermen um, sued Royal Dutch Shell and its Nigerian subsidiary for oil spills in the Niger Delta in 2005, 2004, and 2007. The Niger Delta is central to the lives of the local people, as it provides them with food, work, and even a place to bath. Over the years, and after several spills, pollution has affected the lives of local people and destroyed the surrounding environment. And a couple of weeks ago, the Hague Court of Appeal ordered Shell Nigeria to compensate the Nigerian farmers for the damage caused. So, the idea that companies should only seek profit and the best for their shareholders is outdated, because now society is more aware of what is happening with companies and also we have more information than ever before. This allows us to demand from companies things that in the past were unthinkable, like them being accountable for their actions. And I think this is a pretty good start for what you're going to develop, Laura. Can, can you please explain us a little bit about the UN Sustainable Development Goals? Thank you, Anna, um, for your uh, introductions. And yes, when we talk about business human rights and the environment, there are different frameworks and instruments that we may refer to. As you ask about the UN Sustainable Development Goals or the SDGs and that were adopted in 2015 by a General Assembly resolutions, and they are considered a comprehensive program of action to end poverty, protect the planet and improve the lives and prospects of everyone everywhere. Um, they contain 17 goals and 169 targets to be achieved by 2030, looking at five areas that are uh, people, the planet, prosperity, peace and partnership. And it is also import important to note that the SDGs um, are built upon the work done by the Millennium Development Goals with the aim to complete what they did not achieve. And while the MDGs uh, only apply to developing countries, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, apply universally to all UN member states. And these current goals require the partnership between the private sector and the government as part of these comprehensive efforts to solve the world's development challenges. And it is here where the action of businesses is needed because they are a vital partner in achieving the sustainable development goals. Do you think uh, so? Do you think they are effective in practice because they need the cooperation of companies and the states? Do you think because of this and because we know that some states are not uh, willing to uh, implement some laws that uh, prevent? human rights uh, violations from companies, that this is actually what we need nowadays to stop the violation of human rights and negative impact of businesses in the environment? Well, so the SDGs, uh, as I said, are a program, a program of actions. So they should be translated into a specific uh, actions. And, and the thing about the SDGs is that they are interrelated and each of them will have a different um, form to measure how the states and um, businesses are achieving this goal. 
So far, uh, we are a bit uh, far from what we need to achieve, especially in terms of the environment and climate change. So it is important to find this partnership between the private sector and the governments. And yes, we need to take action now because uh, we, have, we have been seeing the effects on climate change, on human rights violations. So yeah, there's still a, a long road to go. Uh, besides the UN Sustained Development Goals, I know that there was some attempts from international organizations and states to regulate the company's activities uh, with other, other practices and other ways. And one of them was self-regulations by companies. Can you explain a little bit, please? Yes, and so when we talk about the different frameworks applicable to companies, I think we have to first of all refer to the UN Global Compact as one of these um, instruments. And, and this is a voluntary initiative based on companies' commitments to implement universal sustainability principles and to take steps to support the UN goals. Uh, it was launched in 2000 by the former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan um, with the idea to give a human face to the global market, in his words. And uh, the Global Compact has this task to support companies to act responsibly by aligning their strategies and operations with the 10 principles uh, which deal with human rights, labor, environment and anti-corruption. And the UN Global Compact has become one of the key components in this interplay between human rights and business. And actually last year was the 20th anniversary of the Global Compact. And it was found that there has been progress made in the last 20 years, but it was noted at the same time that uh, companies need to take more ambitious actions to meet the objectives of the 2030 agenda. So we already have the same problem. There are some attempts to regulate the company's activities, right? But the problem is, or we have the one, one framework that allows companies to do that themselves. We have another one that has states having the duty to do that. And the problem with both of them is that it's only, um, there's no strict rules. What I mean is, the state doesn't have that duty in practice. It's only a, how can I say, a soft law instrument. So they try to create a binding uh, instrument like the UN norms that you are going to explain next. But did that work? Yes, yeah, so the thing is we have many instruments, but as all as this always happened, we need more commitment on the different stakeholders. Uh, both from states and corporations. And in the last 20 years, yes, there has been progress, but uh, it's not sufficient uh, considering how fast things are moving and considering the, the impacts of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So in fact, uh, as, I, as I said, we need to translate that into a real action. Um, even if there are these attempts, since there is no standard, there is no actual rule that binds states and companies to do something. There's always this thing that there's progress, but there's no effective global solution, right? Well, um, I think there have been important developments. Uh, if we look at the UN uh, framework, for instance, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. So um, the endorsements of the UN guiding principles and the work done by John Raggi, who was the father of the principle and the, the special representative. And I would say, even though the principles are not binding themselves, the endorsement of the UN guiding principles uh, was unanimous. And this is something remarkable due to the, the great work done by John Draghi uh, in this regard. And there are also another current initiative on a binding treaty on business and human rights, although there have been also previous attempts. And the elaboration of this instrument was mandated by the Human Rights Council in 2014. 
and aims to complement and go beyond the UN guiding principles. They have been so far uh, a three and revised uh, three draft versions. The last one from August of last year and uh, consultations will continue over this year and a new revised draft is expected by the end of July of this year. So we'll have to wait to see how things develop, but uh, this could be another way to uh, introduce binding obligations. I know that states have been using these uh, guiding principles as a standard to create legislation in their own states about the regulation of companies. Can you give us an example and explain a little bit what is the impact of these national legislations? Yeah, so um, the guiding principles um, can be implemented through national action plans in, at, the, at the national level. And there have been so far uh, 24 states that have adopted a national action plan. And there are many other states in the process of adopting one, including the case of Portugal. And in the same, in this line, and there have been some states that have been adopted legislations about corporate due diligence. And uh, there are some examples like the French duty of vigilance law that was adopted in 2017 which obliges the largest French companies to identify and address adverse impacts on human rights and the environment. There, there is also the Dutch child labor due diligence law approved in 2019, uh, obliging companies that deliver products or services to the Dutch market to declare that they have carried out a supply chain due diligence relating to child labor. And finally, uh, at the European Union, there is also a current legislative initiative on mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence, which has recently received um, the positive votes of the European Parliament Legal Affairs Committee as one of the first phases of this, uh, in this process. And this legislation could represent a massive step towards uh, responsible business conduct. In terms of uh, due diligence that you refer to, can you explain a little bit what that implies? What is exactly due diligence and what they might, uh, companies might need to do to fulfill that due diligence? Yes, so um, according to the UN guiding principles, companies are expected to exercise human rights due diligence. And this means a process through which a business enterprise uh, should identify, prevent, mitigate and account for the potential and actual human rights impacts. So it's a different processes that a corporation should implement to um, yeah, prevent and mitigate those potential impacts and real impacts. So uh, with all this information, and maybe uh, allowing the people that are seeing our podcast understand a little bit. What do you think, in your opinion, and this is only our opinions, I want to ask Anna and Laura to, to respond to this, but also I'm going to give my personal opinion, of what is the good solution in terms of regulations for corporations. Taking in account uh, what Laura said, for me, at least, I think we need to start in states, but maybe uh, international organizations like the European Union. We have a group of states that have uh, power and influence uh, over other states in the world. And if we start in the European Union to implement to all the European states in the European Union, in any country of the European Union, to uh, have this due diligence process to uh, provide for remedy, maybe we can start to, to see results good for companies, good results for companies. They will see that they actually have more advantages to do that than to just care for profit. And maybe the rest of the world will follow, the United States, uh, Asia countries, Asian countries, uh, other countries with a lot of international power. What do you do you think, Laura? 
Yes, I agree with you that the, this um, initiative at the European Union, for instance, on corporate due diligence is really the way to go because there should be binding obligations over corporations um, regarding the human rights and environmental impacts. And of course, ideally, it would be great if we could finally see a binding treaty where many states participate. So I would say uh, that, uh, yes, definitely legislation on, on uh, corporate due diligence is the way to go. What do you think? Anna? I'm very skeptical about self-regulation. I always have been a little bit skeptical about that. When we talked about, I was thinking how companies can simply write write it down, they try to see if their workers are doing good, they are doing good for the environment. We've seen that happening with a lot of companies and I think they need to do more. We need binding rules, we need strict rules for companies to act to prevent situations and to access the risks of their activities. Uh, so I agree with both of you because we need something happening and i think the european union doing is a very great job and i think it will work but i have to see how how the states put that into their law to really comprehend the impact of of this this legislation and um, if we think about portugal for example we have a very special um type of companies we don't have that much of international power. Uh, when I say international power, we don't have big, big companies with enormous supply chains and things like that. So it, it, it's going to be interesting how they follow rules that are made maybe for a more international point of view. Uh, and I'm very excited to see how, how this is going to be implemented in Portugal, for example. I would like to add to that, that you said, Anna, that um, if you look at the case of Portugal, maybe we also need to educate companies about what are the, the different principles and the, the rules that they should apply, because I think we saw that there is a lack of knowledge on corporations in, in Portugal. And maybe uh, we can use this center as a way to uh, disseminate and bring more knowledge about missing human rights in Portugal. That's what I was going to say. I think we lack a lot of information and knowledge on the matter. If we go to any company in Portugal nowadays, I think it's very difficult to find someone that knows business, human rights and the environment area, doesn't know much about the, the subject, only knows about uh, economic uh, matters or maybe just human rights matters. And we need something that uh, combines the two of them and uh, gives um, uh, a way to, to, to create this process that we are talking about. We are almost ending our podcast. I just would like to add that we are a part of this uh, project of Nova School of Law that was created by Professor Claire. That is called Business, Human Rights and the Environment. We have several uh, social media platforms. For now, just know that the center is, uh, was created with the intention of promoting all of the investigations and works that were made in this area to let people, to inform people about these matters and also to call people's attentions for the problems and the solutions that can be created to solve all of these issues that we talked in this podcast. This is just an introduction. So in the next podcast, we will have many guests that will talk specific topics on the matter of business, human rights and the environment. So please wait for it and <laughs> watch our podcast because I think it will be very interesting to talk on specific uh, matters within business, human rights and the environment. Laura, thank you so much. <laughs> I think it was a great, um, a great first podcast. You brought many uh, things and explain many things that are important to start this, this uh, subject. And also you brought your opinion, which is something that is really important because we are studying these matters. So we know a little bit what 
are the problems and what can solve them. So thank you so much. Thank you, Anna and Alice. And uh, I wish the best luck for the podcast. And I'm looking forward to hearing the next episodes. So I think we'll end here. Please uh, listen to our next podcast. And maybe if we have a chance to, uh, maybe people will uh, be able to comment on this podcast and we'll have some more discussions with people outside of the podcast. So thank you. Stay tuned for the next episode.